Hello there, and welcome to episode number 378 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. Today's episode was recorded live on the 13th of November, 2019 from East City Books. It, this is my conversation with Andy J. Christopher all about Not the Girl You Marry. We are going to talk about the book, obviously, but no spoilers. And we talk about gender updates of familiar stories and tropes. We talk about exactly what should happen to the term unlikable heroine and what stories we really want to read. Now, you can try to guess how many times we mention Chris Evans, and if you're interested, you can take a drink every time we do, because that's a fun game to play along at home. This podcast episode is brought to you by Anyone But a Duke by Bettina Cron. Sexy and Fun, the third Sin and Sensibility novel, sends the youngest sister from a prominent Nevada mining family off to navigate London society in hopes of snagging a duke at a time when new money was closed out of America's East Coast society. New York Times bestselling author Bettina Cron delivers an irresistible romance, shimmering with lighthearted wit, thrilling twists, and get your bingo cards ready, a case of mistaken identity, a country estate in need of some TLC, and some precocious puppies. Anyone But a Duke by Bettina Cron is on sale now wherever books are sold. For more information, visit bettinacron.com. Today's podcast and the transcript are brought to you by In the Unlikely Event by L.J. Shen. If you like Penny Reed, Vi Keeland, and Sophie Kinsella, you'll love this contemporary comedy set in rural Ireland. Malachi Doherty and Aurora Jenkins fell in love when they were 18. But then she moved to America for college and never expected to see him again. The problem is, Aurora promised Mal she would marry him if they ever met again. They even signed a contract on a napkin. How is she supposed to know they'd actually meet? New York Times bestselling author Helena Hunting says this book is the perfect blend of soul-crushing angst, laugh-out-loud wit, and heart-melting romance. And New York Times bestselling author Kylie Scott called it a romance masterpiece. In the Unlikely Event by L.J. Shen is on sale now on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Find out more at authorljshen.com. If you are doing some cooking this week, well, me too. And if you are thinking this is a good time to listen to audiobooks, you're totally right, because that's exactly what I do. Audible has the world's largest selection of audiobooks and audio entertainment, including Audible Originals. You can start listening with a 30-day Audible trial. Choose one audiobook and two Audible Originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash trashy books or text trashy books to 500-500. Now, I'm cooking a lot, and I have been listening to The Story of Human Language, an 18-hour course, yes, 18 hours, on the history of language taught by Dr. John McWhorter, and it is really good. You can get a 30-day Audible trial with one audiobook and two Audible originals for free. Visit audible.com slash trashy books, or this is so cool, text trashy books to 500-500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash trashy books, or text trashy books to 500-500. If you have supported the podcast Patreon, thank you so very, very much. You are helping me make sure every episode is accessible and you keep the show going each week. I want to extend a special welcome to some new members of our Patreon community, to YM, Francisca, Karen, Roxanne, and Taryn. Thank you so much for joining the Patreon community. It is lovely to have you. And if you would like to join, have a look at patreon.com slash smartbitches. Monthly pledges start at $1 a month, and by making a pledge, you're telling me that what we do here has value to you. So thank you so much for considering, and welcome to our newest members of the Patreon community. You are all fabulous. I will have information at the end of the episode as to what is coming up on Smart Bitches. I will have an absolutely dreadful joke, because that's how I do things. And I will have links to everything that we talk about in this episode in the show notes at smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast. But for now, it's time to get started with our live show from East City Books, my conversation with Andy J. Christopher.
My name is Destiny. I am and I say and because we have many people here wear many hats, but I'm an event coordinator here and um, it is my pleasure to welcome you. Is there anyone who's here for the very, very first time? Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I hope it won't be your last time. Um, just a few logistical things. I had a f um, one person ask about the restrooms. They're upstairs and past the registers. And of course, we have tons of books here for sale by our author. I know. Who would have thought it? We we try to go above and beyond here at the bookstore. Um <laughs> It is, as I said, my pleasure to welcome you. Um, I also want to highlight that if you're here for a romance event, you probably would be interested in our romance book club. Um, <laughs> we meet every third Friday of the month. So we are meeting um, this Friday. Um, if you have already read the book, we'd like to have you. Even if you haven't, we'd still like to have you. Um, and yeah, that would just be great to see you again. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our lovely author and moderator or conversationalist, I guess I could say, for this evening. And we will go ahead and get started. Sarah Wendell is the co-founder and current mastermind of SmartBitchesTrashyBooks.com, one of the most popular and longest running blogs examining romance fiction. She spends her days reviewing romance and celebrating the genre with the people who read and write it. Sarah is also the host of Smart Podcast, Trashy Books, now in its 10th year, shout out, right now, on the air. She's also the author of Everything I Know About Love, I Learned From Romance Novels, and Lighting the Flames, a contemporary Hanukkah romance novella. She is the co-author of the book Beyond Heaving Bo Bosoms, the Smart <laughs> Bosoms, <laughs> the Smart Bitches Guide to Romance Novels. She will be in conversation today with our author for the evening, drum roll please, <laughs> USA Today best-selling author, Andy J. Christopher. She's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and Stanford Law School. She lives in the D.C. area with way too many books. Her past titles have included Not That Kind of Guy, One Night in South Beach, and Stand Alone. She will be speaking today about her new book, not the Girl You Marry, which is a heartfelt and steamy tale of Hannah Mayfield and Jack Nolan, who each decide to pursue a fake relationship, each for their own individual gain. Of course, nothing that starts simple stays simple, and the two find themselves to be in way deeper than they thought they would. I found myself completely wrapped up in this delightful story, and it's also our December Romance Book Club pick. Uh, yay! And I am so excited to hear her talk about it today. So please join me in welcoming Andy and Sarah. Yay! Yay! All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so can I have a small round of applause for Destiny, please? Yay! Every bookstore is run by people with Sharpies and box cutters, and it's important to say thank you to the people who have the Sharpies and the box cutters because, well, if you didn't have Sharpies and the box cutters, we wouldn't have the books, right? It's very true. Andy. Congratulations. Hi. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Yay. Thank you all for coming, even though it's really cold. Yeah, I am totally wearing ski base layers because um, it's cold. So the fact that you came out in the cold, put on like real shoes, I'm presuming some bras, that's really, that's really, that's a big deal. I'm wearing pants under a dress. Because it's cold. Yeah, and I'm from Minnesota, so I know cold. Yeah. What are you supposed to do when it's this cold? Stay inside? Stay inside. Drink? Read. Yeah, yeah, basically. Okay. That's, so we that's just it. need we have the books. Yeah, we're inside. We just need to order in some drinks. Right, sounds good. I like Drizzling. your plan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, congratulations. Thank you on the release of your book yesterday. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so wild. How has release been week? We release week been so far. Um, so far it's like okay. So Hannah Mayfield, the main character, she's a an event planner, and so she gets to control everything the day of. When you were an author, you <laughs> control nothing. No. Which I, as an attorney by day, find very stressful. <laughs> so so yesterday, I spent the day like in my pajamas, binging Jack Ryan, discovering new thirsts, um, eating French toast, then sounds exercising. Like a, it was terrible. Um, sounds like a decent day, though. It was, it was a pretty good day. And then one of my mom was like, so how are book sales going? I was like... I don't know. Can we talk about something else? 
Gosh, I mean, I know it's it's already temptation to look at your sales ranking in mm. different retailers and like look to see where you are on this sale or this this site or that bookstore. <laughs> Can you imagine if you had like live stock data, like stock market data for your books? Like, how bad would that be? It would be so bad for podcast listeners. My eyes are very wide right now in fear. <laughs> Um, that was quite a look of horror. <laughs> I, I like it's better if I don't look. I have a couple trusted friends who will look for me, and if I uh, need them to tell, just like pull the good reviews um, and send those to me, or like tell me if it's you know mm-hmm. doing well. That's really good advice, though. It is. I used yeah. to I used to give a workshop about social media for authors, mm-hmm. and I always advised people to have a designated review person. So don't ever have a Google alert for your own name. This is a terrible advice to ever. Don't do it. Don't. Bad idea, Janes. And having that person <laughs> send you only the good stuff, that's a good kind of filtering friend. I have like 10. Nice. <laughs> very high mean. <laughs> that's very cool. <laughs> so do you have a quick pitch for this book? Or how many do you have and what are they? I mean, I have multiple pitches for this book. So I always say, you know, it's sort of a, it's, it's the trope from How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days except updated for – this decade um, with a biracial heroine and a hero who is going to remind you of Chris Evans. That sounds, sounds that's my elevator pitch for the book. And if, if I don't sell them there, I can, I can Updated, gender swapped, how how to lose a guy in 10 days, Mm -hmm. Chris Evans. Right. If you're drinking along, that's two mentions of Chris Evans. (laughs) So you'll need to drink twice. So what do you think are the essentials for a really good gender swap? Because there's a lot of gender swapping going on. And there's a lot of really old sort of decrepit tropes that we could be updating by introducing different uh, different gender into them. What do you think are the elements of a really good – I don't even want to say gender swap because that implies that there's two, two – A gender update date. of a good trope. So I think wherever you can find like an old story that has – old uh, outdated gender roles which basically are all of the stories all of especially all of the romances and wherever you can suss out the patriarchy and then figure out how to subvert it i think that makes for a successful gender swap so like if you are gender updating yeah um i think um for me personally when i was like watching how to lose a guy in 10 days like this was you know, shortly before I decided to to write this book, I was like, you know what? None of the – none of my friends are really trying to be the cool girl so that a guy will like them. They're mostly trying to be um, – trying to be themselves more and then finding someone who matches them. And like most of the people who I know who are trying really hard and failing to find like a productive relationship are actually men because they're so like cis head straight men are so silly like they're like they're very misguided and what like they're you know they're sending dick pics they're saying weird stuff on tinder and hinge and like they're just and you can and I want to like applaud them and you know and be happy that they're like trying to form connections, but like they're really bad at it. And so, what I wanted to do is write a uh, a guy who was like really good at at his heart, and he's actually pretty good at dating. Like in the initial he's stage, really good at dating. He's very good at dating. Oh, he he has charm for 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 days. I I, I mean, I really like him. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love that. I love that part of the prologue where you were like, "I'm still looking for this guy, but I totally wrote him for everybody." <laughs> right? Yeah. No, he like I'm still dating him in my head. Anyway, <laughs> not a bad plan. Yeah, I mean, he's a dreamboat. He is a dreamboat, and I just like I wanted to like do an up, like sort of update it with those those bad things that guys do um, right now on dating apps and in bars and. In the wild. On the dating apps, in the bars. On the dating apps, in the bars, yes. Yeah. While on dates. While on dates. Yeah. There was a story a couple years ago about a guy who had set up multiple – in, in D.C. Yeah. 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 Multiple dates in one night. And they all met and became friends. They formed a coven. and I And I can't help but respect it. 
I think the answer to pretty much any situation is form a coven. <laughs> right. Got a problem? Form a coven. Men suck? Form a coven. Mm-hmm. Why do you have a theory as to why cisgendered straight men make these dumbass mistakes? Is it because they expect women to just contort themselves for them and that they don't have to do any changing? So they're just going to be exactly what they think they're or they're told they should be? Here's the thing. I don't think they're used to having to do anything but like stand there and show their plumage slash money slash yeah whatever. And so I don't think they, a lot of them, know what it what it means to like really like I'm trying to genuinely form a connection with you. Right. I think a lot of I don't know, a lot of my guy friends are just they're very silly. They just mm-hmm. they expect like as soon as they're ready for their like real adult life to start, they're prepared for the re- the girl to show up and and do all the work. <laughs> Like a peer, I'm this nothing. Is, this is why you form a coven, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you can appear in the right place at the right time. <laughs> and he's like <laughs> in front of the right guy, and it's just it, you know. I mean, I think I think it's I think the patriarchy is always my answer. I think oh, yes. you know women have been in sort of burdened or entrusted with like the um, task of forming human connection. I also think that it's one of the things that the patriarchy protects, the idea that guys don't really have to do anything. They don't have to get right. inconvenienced. Nothing's going to get in their way. Mm-hmm. The higher you up on the the higher you are up on the pi- patriarchy staircase, the fewer obstacles are going to be in your way. And the more time you get to spend only doing one thing. Like when's the last time you did just one? Like right? Like I don't ever do just one thing. I'm doing at least 5 things simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Like I know exactly what my son's having for dinner right now. I'm not there, but I know because I'm I'm on that. You know, I, 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 these are part of these are my jobs. I like my jobs, mm-hmm. but for men, I think a lot of the time, especially men who are protected by cisgendered straight status and often wealth and whiteness, they really only have to do one thing at a time. Maybe sometimes zero things at a time, which is like mind blowing, right? <laughs> Like to not do anything, I mean, right? Like, how do you do even, that? I can't even imagine. It's hard to do nothing. It, I mean, it's. I can't do enough. I. I, I, I cannot. Can't. My brain can't do that. Um, I don't know. Like, I think you know, the patriarchy is like, yeah, men just have to do one thing. They either, you know, and for a long time, it was like either be pretty or be rich. And those are and if two. you got both, then you don't right. have to do anything. Exactly. You don't have to have any emotional intelligence. You don't have to like listen to people. You don't have to be a kind person. Um. And women, like you, you have to you have to be the smartest, but not show that you're the smartest. Right. You have to be the prettiest, but not know you're the prettiest. Right. But you have to weaponize your prettiness yeah. without showing that you know that you're pretty. Exactly. And everyone has to like you. Right. Because that's realistic. Right. Right. One of the things you mentioned was about was being being yourself that you and, and the women you know are more interested in being themselves and learning who they are and owning themselves which i think is a process that gets easier as you age i think as you i i think that as you um as you achieve a new birthday your your give up card is renewed at an exponentially lower rate so like i turned 44 i have like two for the whole year and i've already used one so i have one left because i just don't give a crap and the older i get the less craps i give it's very liberating. I I think I I live at a very low. You live F at a level. low F level. That's a yeah. good thing. Um, I carried around a lot of Fs. I didn't need to be carrying. <laughs> I mean, I I I, I turned thirty eight later this month, and I I think I'm out for the year. Nice, I'm pretty good sure. plan. You got to spend those early. I might spend be, the rest of the year like not giving any. Which crap. means I think I'm out for the decade, which is kind of crazy. So wow, yeah, I'm out. Nice, I'm just done. Well played. Mm-hmm. So one of the themes of the book is figuring out how to own yourself and how yeah. to be yourself and not molding yourself to fit what someone else wants, which is what one character does, and not letting someone else's narrative about you decide who you are, which both characters have to deal with that. Yes. That's really hard wiring to undo. It is really hard to do that. What are some of the things that they do to undo those limitations so i think like the conceit of the story is the jack he's he's 
always been the perfect boyfriend who gets dumped and then she meets the guy she's supposed to spend the rest of her life with. So he's he's a unicorn or a narwhal or something like that. He's really great. He's a test drive. <laughs> he's a test he's, drive. He's, the test, he's a very, um, very good test drive, but which he's a test drive. I can imagine happening in real life because I think if you dated Jack Nolan in real life, you would be like, this guy is not real. He is secretly a monster and I'm going to figure out how and why he is a monster. And then I'm going to like... And then I'm going to have to dump him. So I might as well dump him now before he turns yeah, sure, into a monster in my head. Um, and then Hannah, her whole journey with herself, like really sort of mirrors my own. Mine took decades of therapy. Um, but hers takes some – She's but she's much cooler and tougher and um, smarter than I am. And hers took, you know, good girlfriends – Knowing herself and really saying, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this anymore. She just kind of hit her limit with guys telling her who she should be based on, you know, what she looked like and where she came from and who her parents were. And she really just decided to be herself. And she, and at the beginning of the story, she's decided being myself is going to disqualify me from being in romantic relationships ever, ever again. So I'm just gonna say no to that. And then the journey of the story is her being able to see herself through someone else's eyes and, you know, make that determination within herself that, you know what, I do, I am worthy of love and belonging, and I'm going to go after the love and belonging that I want. It's a, it's a tough balance, too, mm -hmm. because on one hand, she has a lot of reason to not trust men to be terrible. Right. She I has mean, a lot of reason to expect terribleness, but she also has to guard herself against the terribleness while also infusing in herself the belief that she's worthy of being in a relationship that treats her with value as opposed to all of the people who have treated her as if she doesn't have value. Right. And I mean, that, I mean, I think that's like the sort of the crux of the journey for anyone. Um, I keep saying journey like I'm on The Bachelorette and I really, I, I like I don't watch that show. <laughs> like it really makes me nervous. It gives me a stomach ache. Um, I can't. I can't watch it either. I can't even edit the recaps someone else writes. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, this really happened. Oh, secondhand embarrassment cringe. It, it makes me very nauseous to watch it because I hate – like one of the things I talk about in the book is that I hate that like I think dating apps make people treat other people like they're commodities. Like – Yes. I don't want to date like I'm shopping at Bloomingdale's. Like I want to shop at Bloomingdale's like I'm shopping at Bloomingdale's. I like these shoes. I like this guy. No. Right. No. I – like – and I know, like, I never, I'm not a good judge of, like, if, if I want to like a guy in person based on w whether I like what he has to say and what his picture looks like on, a, on an app. So I, I don't app date anymore. But, like, I think shows like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette tend to treat people like commodities because, you know, they are commodities to a certain extent. They're on television. They're, you know, selling a product. Um, Half of them are there to become product salespeople. Exactly. They're there to become influencers, which, you know, I respect the hustle. I really do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, that's the, that, I mean, the thing yeah. is like accepting yourself is not, it's not an easy task. It's not something you can do in like 300 pages. But I think, you know, Hannah's on her way there. Once we meet her in the book, I think she, she owns who she is in yes. a lot of ways. Yes. She owns that she's really good at her job. She owns that she's like smart and has her, has her ish together. Yes. Um, but she just has this like one area where she's just not – it's not working for her. One thing I loved about her as a character is that because she's an event planner – and by the way, I won't spoil anything if you haven't read the book yet. I promise no spoilers. Um, I love that she's an event planner. She takes care of everyone else's mess so that no one sees any – problems she makes the way smooth for everyone else around her and these and i've been an event planner that that is hard work and she can manage so much she has such skill at managing all of these difficult personalities yeah and i mean i like i don't know it was my knowledge of event planning is limited to sort of like what people in my family have done at, as event planners and so one of the inspirations for Hannah's like philosophy is like she's she's like my you know my good regard is is pretty easy to keep and my like bad opinion is very difficult to honor and I, I that's not a direct quote but that's kind mm -hmm. of like her thing like she's like people need to do their jobs 
Um, and she's very unforgiving about people not doing their jobs, um, which I think makes it harder for her to date because it's like no one knows what the job is when they're interviewing to be her boyfriend, a.k.a. going on a first date. So true. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think she's she's a tough customer and she really just – she she does clean up everybody else's messes and you can tell it from like her relationship with her best friend. She's like, I know what this mess is. I'm going to fix it for you and we're not going to let it affect anything else. Yeah. But part of that is her way of like pushing emotions away right. and not feeling. I can handle them. They're yeah. problems. I can solve them. Exactly. I have a clipboard. It's hard to be vulnerable with a clipboard. You, you cannot. It's a weapon and a shield <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> One of the things that Hannah describes herself as early chapter, no spoilers, I promise. She she describes herself as not entirely domesticated, which I loved so much. What does that mean for her? Um, she has a hard time not she has a hard time being uh not telling the truth. Um, or doing like the she just has a hard time just, you know papering over things she's not going to smooth the way with falsehood she's going to smooth the way by fixing the problem and the problem might be telling you what your problem is exactly which not everyone wants in their friend and that's a quality i share so like people who are my friends just know that like don't ask me your opinion if you didn't really want it (laughs) (laughs) yeah i've had to ask my my friends and, and members of my family do you want me to be honest here or do you want me to just listen because I have many opinions, but you might not want to hear them. Yeah. I mean, I've told people, like, I don't think you want me to to opine on this. <laughs> like, I can't. Just, I will listen, but you do not want me to speak. It would be bad. Right. Like, I mean, I have a, um, I had a, a relative who had a legal problem. And I said, your legal problem is not a legal problem. It, the problem is with who you're dating. That's the start of another book, I think. <laughs> Probably. Probably. Yeah, I think yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Yeah. And yet with with Hannah, she is going to fix your problem. She's not going to pretend like everything's okay. And therefore, right. she's not going to put up with any person, especially somebody who's a prospective date, treating her as a commodity, and especially as a, as a disposable commodity that her that, that she doesn't matter and that her emotions don't matter. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think she's she's a she's a grown up and she likes herself to know that she is not a problem. No. And she's not going to pretend that she's a problem for someone else to solve. Okay. Now, I know you have things to say about this question. We, we, we went over the question. All right. So, no spoilers. Another thing that I really like about Hannah, if you haven't read this book, and then a lot of readers have also mentioned, is that it is an asset to her and to her character that she's unapologetically angry. She's pissed about a whole lot of things. She owns her anger. She sort of walks around with like a low grade rage. You need a kind of a semi big handbag to carry that rage, probably a crossbody. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she has rage all the time and she's earned it and she knows it intimately. And I remember researching my first book, which came out in 2009. So I was doing this research over 10 years ago, talking with authors about how when they write heroines at that time, so this would have been 2005, 2006, romance was a slightly different landscape then, your heroines had to be like Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, not too much, not too little, not too mean. They had to be perfectly nice and kind of boring. And there was this very, very specific, just right, narrow definition for heroine. And then you started to see people start talking about the unlikable heroine. And the heroine is a bitch, which is a word I like a lot. And we have heroin. Well, we have Hannah, who is just owning how fed up she is and is so over this bullshit. I loved it. It was delicious. Were you worried at all about how she might be received? Um, I think we need to take the term unlikable heroine, wrap it in something very flammable and throw it in a fire along with like most of the patriarchy. Okay. I Sounds think, great. Let's do it. Yeah. This is why we have yeah. a coven. This is why we have a coven. <laughs> I am so sick of that term, unlikable heroine. It just means your heroine's like a real person. With uh, flaws. With flaws. Yeah. With flaws who is not nice all the time. And I think the idea that I, that a heroine has to be not too much or not too little to be likable is ludicrous. I want to read a person that I can imagine being friends with 
And I don't think any of my friends are always nice people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Even though some of them are sitting here. <laughs> like, you know, you're not always nice people. You're not in my head at that. Um, I just like I want and I also want to read heroines that are too little that are afraid. Like I like I mean, if you if you can't make a reader feel something about your main female character without people reacting badly, then it's not a you problem. It's a, it's a patriarchy problem. And if you can't make your character like a full person with flaws um, and have anyone like react to her, then I mean, that's, that's a writing problem. So it's, I, I love it kind of subversively when I see someone say that Hannah's a bitch and I'm like, yeah, she's a bitch. And also she deserves to be loved by a good person because she's a good person. She's loyal to her friends. Um, I'm going to get choked up because I love her so much and I've had two glasses of wine. (laughs) 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 But But isn't it interesting that we had all of these milk, uh, milky, milk toast, I think is the word I'm looking for. Milk toast. Heroines for years who were not too abrasive and not too difficult and they were always perfect, but they didn't know how pretty they were. Mm-hmm. And then the evolution of that, the way you get them away from that is to say, oh, they're unlikable. Unlikable by who? Because I often really like them. Yeah. If someone <laughs> says a heroine is unlikable, I ultimately want to, I ultimately want to pick that book up next like, it's like this book has too much sex in it i'm sorry what, what was the name of that <laughs> book what, what well, did you call ISBN that book ISBN number please yes <laughs> like, i spell that for me right yeah i mean i like i i think sort of my um inspirations in romance lauren dane and molly o'keefe um among many many others uh really write those kind of heroines and so I think when I was thinking about writing a rom-com I always wanted to write like a rom-com with the kind of heroine that like Molly O'Keefe would write <laughs> she writes some heroines with some serious issues right like no they got, they got flaws <laughs> yeah like she's not Hannah's not kidnapping anyone but no like... no and she's not forcing her kid to, play, to spend time with an abusive grandparent or anything like no, that. no 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 there are a lot of times with reading Molly O'Keefe books where I'm hooked, I'm in, I'm going for it, I'm reading, I am not putting this book down, but there's a part of me going, oh, honey, no, 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 oh, you did. Shit. Now I got to turn the page. Yeah. 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 I mean, I... I, I and that's a real person. Real people mm-hmm. do stuff like that. Yeah. Not, not unlikable people. Real people that I'm friends with and I'm related to that, you know, I am sometimes, yep. Um, you know... I think as long as you're as long as my characters have like a core of like certain qualities Mm -hmm. that I like loyalty, kindness. um, I I really I like writing a smart heroine. Um, Just that's, you know, that's my thing. And, you know, maybe she thinks she's smarter than everyone. But that's also my thing. She's not wrong. (laughs) <laughs> also she's not wrong she's like, not wrong she owns her anger she's entirely justified she's extremely smart and she's not here for your crap exactly if you didn't and bring it, your a game she has no time right and i mean also like i think you know no spoilers like i don't think she holds unnecessary grudges like i no. think you know she's not unreasonable no that's the thing her anger and her and her frustration and her prickliness is not unreasonable it's totally understandable Right. And I mean, also, since so much of that comes from me and and the time during which I was I was writing it in early 2017 when I was just real angry at everything and like I could only ex- expend so much of that anger at the gym. Um, <laughs> Everyone has repetitive stress injuries. <laughs> right, right, right. I was like, I can only spend an hour at the gym. I need to like write a woman who wants to burn the world down. Um, Good plan. For the right reasons. Very therapeutic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with Jack, he is skating on a very smooth path of a lot of hallmarks of goodness. He is a good guy in the good sense of that. Like not like, oh, he's a good guy where you like kind of curl your lip and you don't actually mean it because you can't really actually say what you think about him. No, he's actually good. He's a good dude. He has a lot of charm and he knows that he's good looking and he knows that he's really good at being a boyfriend. Um, and yet he has to level up. He has to grow up a little bit, which is a tr- is a tricky balancing act because you have him starting at like a Chris Evans level. That would be three mentions. My fault. Um, 
you have him starting at a pretty high level already and, and then you level him up. What was, how did you, how did you approach that? I mean, I, I like, I, I knew I had Hannah on my hands who starts out as like, She's going to like, she's going to be like the element of, you know, when you're composing a painting or you're composing something, you think like she's going to like sort of scream at people. And so you need something to balance that out. Yeah. And so I knew that I couldn't write. And also Hannah wouldn't have responded to um, like the McConaughey archetype. She wouldn't have. Like, I mean... Nothing wrong with that archetype, if that's your thing. I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum. But. That's not her thing. It's not her thing. No. She, like, she wouldn't have even, like, you know, talked to him at the bar in the first scene. She would have been like, listen, no, no, you, you got to go away. Like, you're creepy. I don't like it. Um, <laughs> he falls backwards into a pool, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. In these weird car commercials. Mm -hmm. And he acts like that makes sense. Yeah. That's why I can't get on board. Like, like with his watch on. Right? Like, what is <laughs> happening? Why does falling backwards into a pool feel like driving a car? I mean, he, and he's like, this makes total sense. I'm like, no. I mean, you I don't do have that much charm. <laughs> I do like his voice, but like, I, I well, don't. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he can stay out of the pool and just talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Like, those Italian wool pants would be like a bitch to get clean. I'm just saying. Um, and you know, there's chlorine in there. Right. But I don't get it. They're ruined. I anyway. really don't get it. So I thought I'd start with like a Chris Evans. Uh, archetype for <laughs> um, he cheers everybody <laughs> he's like you know your average sort of like white woke white boy who like knows he's good looking but like really he really tries and that's yes. what I think is so charming about him is he yes. really really tries to be a good person and that's like I think what you need at base and I don't like and I think sometimes because he is like the internet's boyfriend people expect him to be perfect mm-hmm and he's not perfect. And I think that's kind of like, that's kind of like, like Hannah, I like a little, you know, like a fixer upper, just like a little, like I like a little project mm -hmm. to, to, to look at. So like you could see like Jack saying, I want to get both sides of every story. And Hannah being like, you don't need both sides of every story. Like the one side is right. The other side is wrong. <laughs> the one side is right. The other side is evil. And just yeah. like, because her like moral compass points in one direction. And I think because he is, you know, relatively privileged, white dude, good looking, has never really deeply struggled for anything in his life. I think that's ultimately going to like re require someone to level up at some point if they want to be with someone like Hannah. Mm hmm. Definitely. And you've inverted another pair of gender gender stereotypes there mm -hmm. because so often in romance 10, 15 years ago, it was the, the prickly, angry, resentful, grumpy man who needed to be soothed and tamed and, and, and shaped gently by the heroine. And here you have this really charming, gentle guy who's like, wow, you're prickly and really wow really prickly but i'm still fascinated whoa ouch that hurt oh i'm still fascinated by you he is trying to basically just slightly smooth her her spines just just very slightly so they don't get him in the juggler right like he just he's like i i like being around this like very dangerous thing yeah that could hurt me and i just need to figure out how to be around it without it turning Hurting on me. me right yeah and also knowing that if he can get closer to her that there is someone there he really wants to True. be with beneath all of the, the prickle. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's where his charm comes in. Like he yeah. has to, you know, he has to marshal all of his charm, even as he's trying to be less charming. Yeah. Which. He's not very good at not being charming. <laughs> he's really not skilled at, at being terrible, <laughs> which is a good skill to have to, to not be terrible. Right. It's a win. I mean, I just, I just. Like, I wish he was right here. I just love him so much. Like, he's like, you know, I feel like everybody deserves a Jack Nolan. You must have had such a nice time disappearing into this book while you were writing it. Like, I get to hang out with these people some more. Right. I love, I mean, I love, um, I love the family in the book because uh, the father is like a dead ringer for my grandfather. Like, all of his, like, isms, like the things he said, like, you know, 
are things my grandfather would have said, like the sex talk he gives the boys and like I excerpted it to flashback and like I'm like, yeah, that's that's definitely how like a a gruff dude raising two teenage boys by himself by himself yeah. would have done works. that. Yep. Um so that was fun. And I mean the friendship between uh Hannah and Sasha, who are best friends, I just like I loved experiencing that because a lot of my best friends live from college, live far away. So and they know me so well. And so disappearing into like two people who like know each other so well that they all they have to do is like make eye contact in order to communicate. That was lovely. Yeah. And they have so many languages. Like they, they have do. signals, they have looks, they have words, they have code. Mm-hmm. I love a book with multiple ways that people communicate. It makes the story so much richer because people don't just communicate through dialogue. It, right. It, there's a lot of other subtext that goes on. Right. And they, you know, they communicate through history. And like, I love one of my favorite scenes to write that made me cry. Like when I wrote it and when I edited it was like during the dark night of the soul, no spoilers, when um, the main character is talking to her best friend um, and kind of has her own reckoning with herself that like, it's that honesty. Mm-hmm. It's earned over time. Mm-hmm. So it's a privilege uh, to be vulnerable to someone. Yeah. And it's a vulner it's a privilege to have someone be vulnerable to you. Right. Absolutely. So you recently were set up on Twitter by Nicole Cliff. And I have a I have a question for one of the smart bitches readers. How did Nicole Cliff's Twitter setup go? And did you end up going out with anyone because of that? So I didn't end up going on any dates, and I have a story about that. Like, so I got a couple of weird messages. I no. did. Yeah. <laughs> Shocking. I mean, I actually have earned a couple of permanent reply guys, which is, you know, okay, lovely. Anyway, um, so I got a couple of weird messages. I did. I set up one date, and I decided not to go because he sent me like reading material ahead of time, and I was like, I'm not going to go on this date with I'm you. I'm sorry, he sent you homework? Yeah, he was like. We were gonna we were gonna go have margaritas. <laughs> That's so DC. <laughs> no, it wasn't any house bills. I, I would have rather like it, it feels, feels DC. No, I don't have He's he like sent me reading material about tequila that we were gonna like go drink sipping tequila and I was like, I don't need to read about tequila to enjoy it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and then there was one guy I spent some time like chatting back and forth with over most of the stuff. Just like, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> yeah. So okay, you didn't so, go on a date with Tequila Guy. I didn't because he gave you homework. <laughs> and most guys were like, "Well, I'm not anything like what you're looking for, but you should still go out with me." And I'm like, "But you're not anything like what I'm looking for." And I was very why like, should I settle? <laughs> right. Okay. I'm like my life is good. I don't really need to like. Um, go on dates that I don't think are going to go anywhere. Right. Anyway, so um, there was one guy who uh, some friends were like, "Ooh, ooh, this guy," and they basically like bullied him into messaging me. Ooh, but it was. I mean, he was like, "Well, I live in Vegas, and I'm not gonna." Well, if he hears this, whatever. <laughs> um, so and he lives far away, and he um, he you know, he had potential. And we, um, you know, were texting almost every day, and it was going great. And then I went to RWA, and I was out of touch in New York, and I was out of touch for a few days. And he sent me a couple of text messages after I got back that were, like, disrespectful about romance, which is... Oh, ouch. Yeah. So I uh, peaced out, and I actually, like, I, I got confirmation that it was a good decision after... Um, my dog passed away and he didn't, and you know, we had talked a lot about my dog and he did not message me to say, to send his condolences. And so I was like, good riddance. So, oh no. Yeah. Dude. Right. Oh, so Twitter set up. I mean, great. I think like, I think it could work great. Um, it just didn't in my case. And I mm. and I am a prickly heroine like Hannah, so I I, I I I do like prickly heroine. That's a good term. Yeah, that's it's better than heroin. unlikable. Unlikable, Screw unlikable. Yes. Screw unlikable. Yeah, burn it in a fire. Prickly, I like mm. that. Any other dating stories you want to share? Oh gosh. I mean, I was um, so after the last event that 
I did here with Jasmine Guillory. We went out to dinner at um, one of my favorite restaurants in DC. They and they have this um, open face sandwich that has like it's not ethical to eat, but foie gras in it, and it's the most delicious thing I've ever put in my mouth. And I was on a date once, and we ordered one of these sandwiches, and it was so good, and it's very tiny. And I said, um, should we get another one because it's tiny? And he was like, he looked at me, and he was like, better not. (gasps) All right. I know that guy. I was in a pre-childbirth class. With that guy and his wife. No. Well, I'm in the. I'm in the. Everyone's having first baby, so everyone's nervous, and we're all listening to this nurse like it is the gospel because she knows exactly how long labor is going to last. No one knows. <laughs> it's a variable. It's a very big variable. There is this woman who is so anxious, and I had a lot of empathy for her, but her husband kept saying, "Well, you know, she jogs like five miles every day. She's nine months pregnant. She and I at that time could take a dinner plate and just rest it on our bellies, like it was full size dinner plate time." And she's like, yes, I, I run every day. And she didn't look happy about it. And then the nurse starts talking about how in the immediate, per, you know, before you go into labor, you often have a lot of water gain. And that could be you're dangerous. You need to pay attention, especially if your feet start to swell up. And her husband says to the whole room, oh, she won't gain any more weight. <gasps> and there was a guy next to him who just went. Eyes wide down at the table. Don't look at anybody. And I could see under the table, his wife was gripping his knee, like trying to prevent herself from launching at this man. So I've met him. She won't gain any more weight. She's just dating an entire other human. She gets donuts, y'all. Yeah. (laughs) She gets to eat whatever she wants. Oh, yeah. I've met that guy. He's horrible. Get away from him. Or another sandwich. I was like, I I wish I would have said, as Hannah would have said, you can leave now. I'm going to get another sandwich. (laughs) I like that. Like, so aside time. from ordering another sandwich, which you should do because deliciousness should be yeah. enjoyed, what do you do to take care of your creative self? Um, uh, So like I mentioned before, I have I've become like a religious exerciser, except I don't like to leaving my house to exercise. So I do like free online workouts with pop sugar and I have like weights and stuff in my house. And um, there's another there's another online trainer, and she's actually my my new favorite. Her name is Heather Robertson, and she's this nice blonde Canadian lady who never yells at you. <gasps> um, I love that. Yeah, I mean, never yells at you. She like you know is gently encouraging at the beginning and gives you like a, a high, basically a high five when you're done. And her workouts are free, and um, they're really really hard, um, but they you know they keep me. Sane and focused. And I'm also at the age where if I don't exercise almost every day, like everything hurts. So I do that. Um, I meditate. I uh, hang out with my friends. I go to brunch. My friend Katie is here. Yeah. She's my brunch buddy. Um, brunch is, is a coven with eggs. It is a coven. Yeah, with eggs. Coven. Coven, coven with eggs. We do. We do. A coven with eggs. Coven with eggs and mimosas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, D.C. has a lively bottomless mimosa culture. Uh, <laughs> Cheers to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, I also try to get enough sleep. Like I, like I'm not oh, one of those people yes. who's like, th- like I, I admire J.R. Ward. I love her books, but uh, I, her whole fuck self care thing. I'm like, I gotta sleep, yo. <laughs> like, I gotta oh, no. sleep. Sleep is the most important thing for um, me. I'm the bedtime commander. Everyone in my house is going to bed. My kids won't tell people their bedtimes because they're too embarrassed. <laughs> But they're human and they function and they're like, yeah, I had a really good night's sleep and I feel good. And I'm like, you can say you're welcome yes. to me, to me. I'm like, no. <laughs> sleep is really important. Sleep is really important. And even when I'm in deadline, I shower every day and like, you know, put on real clothes because I feel like that makes me feel more human. Um, I'm lucky enough to be able to put a lot of words on the page, you know, for a first draft pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um Especially if I get up first thing in the morning and do it before, like I go into the office or do anything else. Um, so, I mean, I also say no a lot. That's very important. Yeah. Like people ask me to do stuff and I'm like, I, I, I really try to take a second to think about like whether or not I, can, I have the capacity to do it and if it's yeah. going to interfere with my, my creative work. Yeah. That's, and it's hard to defend that time. Really hard because I feel bad when I have to say, when I feel like I need to say no, but I yeah. but I do say no. That's good though. But if I say yes, that means like I really want to be there and it's important to me. Yeah, I I don't remember exactly where I heard this first, but there's there if it's if it's not hell yes, then it's no. Yeah, 
if you are not 100% enthusiastic on board for whatever is happening, then it's a no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nope. Sorry. Can't. All right. I always ask what you're reading. So I want to hear about books. And then I'm going to open it to the floor and ask all of you to submit questions. I accept math. We, trigonometry is fine. <laughs> for you. <laughs> no, not for me. Okay. So. What you're reading. Tell me all about it. One of the good things about being in Romance Landia and having friends in Romance Landia is they will send you your, their books early. So one of the books I'm really excited about is Love Lettering by Kate Claiborne. It comes out at the end of December and it is so fun and so sexy and so – it's like quirky without being Manny, Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Like I just love the heroine so much. And it's um, it's all first person from the heroine's perspective – um, which I can't do, and I just admire how she does it so well. So that's like one of my faves that's coming up. Um, one of my other very good friends, Adriana Anders, has a romantic suspense coming up. It's, oh, the one in Antarctica? Yeah. Is it good? It's insane. How gory is it? It's It wasn't too gory for me, and I don't read super gory things. Okay. It's – um. I need to know how much entrails are in my books. It's an important – it's called Whiteout. Whiteout. It is um, insanely sexy. It's like two – like as insanely sexy as you can imagine two people like in full snow gear being. Just multiply that by 10. Um, it's it's mostly about the survival. That is the that is the crux of the book. So like en- entrails – I mean there's, a, there's some death but – yeah, um, it's suspense. There's going to be something. Yeah. I mean, it's just like it's so gripping. It was one of those that I actually did lose sleep over. There's very few authors that I lose sleep over. Adriana is one of them. Another one um, that I read recently was uh, The Kingmaker by Kennedy Ryan. She's uh, my podcast guest this week. She is very funny. You, she you is like this episode. So funny. She's, She's hysterical. A delight. Her books are not light. But she is no one of the lightest people I've ever met. And so this book and the next book, The Rebel King, comes out, I think, on s- this Sunday. Yeah. So after we record this, um, it is like um, The Kingmaker is unfreaking believable. It, it was another one that kept me up really late. Other than that, I've been, e- been reading a lot of historicals. Um, I am a perpetual fan of Joanna Shoup. Um, I recently discovered my love for Kerrigan Byrne, like the highwayman. <laughs> it is. The Hunter is so good. They're bananas. Oh, they're absolutely crazy sauce. Yep. I love it. I'm I'm going to meet her next year, I think, at a, poly- a Polycon, and she's one of those people who I'm like, I'm going to legit. Your inner 13-year-old is going to lose her cool? My inner 13-year-old is going to lose her cool. <laughs> Um, and then I'm reading um, right now is a uh, is a an arc of my fake rake by Eva Lee, and it is it's uh, like it is like an '80s teen movie, except in the Regency. Yeah, it's the Breakfast Club, right? Yeah, sort of. yeah, that's the that's the sort of conceit for the whole series. And this one I think is sort of loosely based on weird science, but it just it feels '80s teen movie, but in the Regency, and the hero. It's like a tall blonde Viking who doesn't know – like speaking of subverting the patriarchy, he like doesn't know that he's like sex on legs and it's just – it's so charming. <laughs> awesome. All right. Who has questions? I would like questions. I, yes, ma'am. So do you get to be involved in the uh, in the cover design process, especially yeah. with the new trend towards illustrated covers? Oh, thank you. I am um, very cute. So when I sent my so my editor said, "Oh, so what are your ideas about the cover?" And I uh so I was I minored in art history in um undergrad and so like I, I sort of had a language for like composition in a way, um which I think helped. But I said, "Okay, so I wanted to kind of mirror or mimic the um movie poster for How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days because I wanted to signal that trope in a way." Mm-hmm. And then, um, like, I want it to show – I want it, the cover to show it's in Chicago. Like, I le- love, like, a graphic sort of mid-century font. Um, and then, you know, they they sent that. But, I mean, in terms of, like, I think when we were talking about, like, what the books would really look like because it, um, it was a proposal, 
um, you were definitely thinking illustrated cover and trade just because that's where the rom coms are going. Where the rom coms are going. And yeah. so we wanted to signal that it is that it is a rom com. Um it's a series. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, with the second with the book the cover of the second book, Not That Kind of Guy, which is out in April, um it was yeah. So I, I and I also like I sent pictures of who I thought they looked like <laughs> and they like somehow made Matt, who's on the, the the hero of the second book, they somehow made him like so sexy as an illustration. I can't even. It's like <laughs> it's two colors. <laughs> and yet it really works. I was like, oh wow. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm here for it. Okay. <laughs> um and that one, uh, you know, we like I we didn't like look at options. We just looked at that one. And so Colleen Reinhardt in the Berkeley um, art department, and she also designs uh, Helen Wong's covers. Uh, she's just, she's amazing. And like they, they, what they even took time to like, I was like, Oh, I think her dress should have colors in it. Um, and they found a dress, like my editor found a dress online and was like, can we make that happen? Um, on the cover? Like actually Gus was a total surprise. I didn't dictate that. And he just showed up. So I love it. Aww. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. This question was about portrayals of faith in Andy's books. That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think um, most of my books have like featured an element of Catholicism, whether I was like sort of writing Latinx characters. And so I'm part Latin- Latinx and like my friends who are Cuban American, like their faith is sort of it's it's all around and i think growing up sort of in an irish american family my mom's irish american um that it was just always around um and so it, like even if i think there are th- like you know there's there are cultural catholics just the way that there are cultural jews like there are people who are you know non practicing catholics who Still, just like it's a culture. I think it's a subculture, and I think um, it's been a theme in my writing. Because um, I think if you look at you know most of my titles, there's there's one character that's Catholic, and it you know shifts the narrative. But this, I just was like, well, they they live in the South Side of Chicago. They're Irish Catholic. They're it's just going to be a part of it. And then um, and he relies on it too. He does. He relies on his choir boy reputation <laughs> good looks yeah yeah i mean he he uh he does i mean i think um i think one of the real life people he was modeled on kind of had that going on and so that was in my head and also i liked the idea of making and this is not a spoiler one of his best friends is a priest that he grew up with and i think that was an interesting friend relationship that I wanted to explore. Any other questions? This person asked about being a writer and what you do when you're stuck. Sometimes I write something really shitty. Sorry, I'm swearing. Um, it's fine. Okay. It's a podcast. But, you know. I have no FCC oversight. I can say whatever I want. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Go ahead. Um, bring it. I have, I have a permanent explicit rating on my show. I just, okay. I just rated the whole show explicit. I just figured, what the fuck, right? <laughs> well, there you go. Just why, give it up. Why was I not dropping up bombs the whole time? Anyway. Um, so, uh, well, I didn't want to drop them because, you know, wh- where's the kids section? Isn't it true, like right, right there? Over there? I was trying to, trying to be aware of, you know, maybe some children shopping. Yeah, it's uh, true. They'll, they'll figure it out. Um, yeah, sometimes I write something really shitty and just – deciding to fix it in post and then as a placeholder or sometimes I just say well TK and then move on um but most of the time if I've if I've done like the groundwork and the legwork if I have like a solid synopsis when I start I can say well I'm just gonna write the next scene in the synopsis and if it doesn't work then I'll fix it um but usually, like, I, I don't get super stuck most of the time. And most of the time, I give myself enough time to write. Um, and especially, you know, with these books, since they're longer and they're coming out, like, less frequently than the category-length romances I was doing, I think they – I have enough time to, to think about it. And I'm not one of those, like, you have to write every day or you're not a writer, people. I just – I don't subscribe to that because that's not realistic for most people with jobs and 
kids and any anything else going on in their lives. Um, and sometimes I binge right at the end, but um, most of the time, if I'm like really in the story, I can I can get there. Yeah. You had one. You had a question. Oh, which sandwich? The, the, the one. Fo- oh, the, the sandwich? Oh, it's a Stadio. It's the uh, Spanish oh. tapas restaurant on 14th. It's really yummy. Have- That's a good question. These are important <laughs> things to know. Yeah. I, I dropped the ball and didn't ask. Thank you for following up. Yeah. And then my other favorite restaurant in D.C., not that you asked, is um, Shea Billy in Georgetown is my, like, the duck hump beat is just quality. Just don't bring a bad date there. Yeah, you don't want to ruin it. Right, no. No. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. I want to thank Destiny Eddy City Books and Andy J. Christopher for making a really fun, very cold evening even better. You can find Angie J. Christopher on her website, andyjchristopher.com, and she's on Instagram and Twitter at authorandyj. You can find us at smartbitchestrashybooks.com. I am on Twitter at smartbitches. And you can get in touch with us, if you would like, at sbjpodcast at gmail.com. This podcast was brought to you by Anyone But a Duke by Bettina Cron. Sexy and Fun, the third sin and sensibility novel, sends the youngest sister from a prominent Nevada mining family off to navigate London society in hopes of snagging a duke at a time when new money was closed out of America's East Coast society. New York Times bestselling author Bettina Cron delivers an irresistible romance, shimmering with lighthearted wit, thrilling twists, and a case of mistaken identity, a country estate in need of some TLC, and some precocious puppies. Anyone But a Duke by Bettina Cron is on sale now wherever books are sold. For more information, visit bettinacron.com. Today's podcast and the transcript are brought to you by In the Unlikely Event by L.J. Shen. If you like Penny Reed, Vi Keeland, and Sophie Kinsella, you will love this contemporary comedy set in rural Ireland. Malachi Doherty and Aurora Jenkins fell in love when they were 18. Then she moved to America for college and never expected to see him again. The problem is, Aurora promised Mal she would marry him if they ever met again, They even signed a contract on a napkin. How is she supposed to know they'd actually meet? New York Times bestselling author Helena Hunting says this book is the perfect blend of soul-crushing angst, laugh-out-loud wit, and heart-melting romance. And New York Times bestselling author Kylie Scott called it a romance masterpiece. In the Unlikely Event by L.J. Shen is on sale now on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Find out more at authorljshen.com. If you have supported the show with a monthly pledge, thank you so much for being part of our Patreon community. And if you would like to join, you can have a look at patreon.com slash smartbitches. It would be so wonderful to welcome you into our Patreon community. Monthly pledges start at $1 a month, and every pledge makes a deeply appreciated difference. So what's coming up on Smart Bitches this week? I'm so glad that I asked that question, actually. It is time for What You're Reading Part 2. We're going to talk about all the books we're reading. You're going to tell us what you're reading, and we're going to all buy more books. I mean, that's what happens to me. I presume that's also what happens to you. We are also going to have some reviews for brand new books you are going to love. Plus, we have a new cover snark, Help a Bitch Out, a new holiday gift guide, and a rec league you are not going to want to miss. Plus, we have books on sale every day, so I hope you will come by smartbitchestrashybooks.com and hang out with us. I will have links to all the books we talked about and some of the things we mentioned in the episode. And again, thank you to East City Books for hosting us that evening, and thank you to everyone who came out to make this a fun event. As always, I end with a really bad joke, and this is really, really bad. I like this one a lot. What do you call a girl who smells like cantaloupe? Give up? What do you call a girl who smells like cantaloupe? Melanie. <laughs> so bad. That's from Blitzkrieger23, and it makes me so stupidly happy. <laughs> On behalf of everyone here, including my dog, who would really like to leave my office, except I shut the door for better sound, we wish you the very best of reading. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you back here next week. 
Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more outstanding podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcasts. Thank you.